Good morning. Welcome to Collington United Methodist Church's worship service. I'm glad you could be with us this morning. I'm so grateful that we have um, this virtual opportunity to worship together. So many people unable to attend a worship service are now able to share and worship together online. And for that, I'm so grateful. Um, we will continue to uh, wait for some folks to join us this morning. I see Kathy and Patsy have come on. Good morning, ladies. Glad to see you this morning. There's Dolores. Um, good morning. Good morning. Gordon, good morning. Thank you for your prayers. Trisha, hello. Good morning. Welcome. It's so good to see you, you folks this morning as we worship together online. We'll give uh, some other folks a, a bit of time to, to join us. Um, I've tried to play music that didn't work, so we're just going to talk to you until we get some more folks online. Good morning, Robin and Scott. And there's Stephanie. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us this morning. Um, this is the sixth Sunday of the Easter season, and we are continuing our worship service on the I am sayings of Jesus. Um, as we prepare to worship together, be sure to uh, adjust your calendars this week. There's prayer group on Zoom at 9 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. We invite you to join if you'd like to. Just send me an email or a text. I'll send you an invitation. We have Bible study every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Looking forward to that. And uh, just want to share what a great experience it was on Thursday evening when we went to the mobile food pantry and served uh, 113 people, uh, about 40 something families. But our, our volunteers were just excellent. We did such a good job. And the folks from the food bank of the Albemarle came and uh, told us what a great job we were doing. So thank you all. Thank you for social distancing. Thank you for face masks. Thank you for doing all the things you really don't want to do to keep everybody safe. We appreciate that. Um, we've got some prayer coming in, prayer requests coming in this morning. We'll take care of those in a little bit. But uh, I, I encourage you to light a candle, to get in the spirit of worship to prepare your hearts to receive the spirit this morning as we go to god in prayer let us pray gracious god we thank you so much for this day for this time together we pray lord that you would prepare our hearts and minds and ears to hear your word to feel your word to know your word as we worship together we ask this in jesus name amen our first lesson this morning comes from Ephesians and Ephesians uh, in the second chapter verses four through seven talks about the life we have in God. Paul tells us God was merciful. We were dead because of our sins, but God loved us so much that he made us alive with Christ and God's wonderful kindness is what saves you. God raised us from death to life with Christ Jesus, and he's given us a place beside Christ in heaven. God did this so that in the future world, he could show how truly good and kind he is to us because of what Christ Jesus has done. May God add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. Amen. Our gospel lesson comes from the 11th chapter of John as we continue our uh, series in John on the I Am Sayings. This is a story you know and will remember. When Jesus arrived, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one coming into the world. When she said this, she went back and called her sister, Mary, and told her privately, the teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Mary had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. And they followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. Mary came where Jesus was and saw him. She knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping. He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. And so the Jews said, see how they loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. And all God's people said, thanks be to God. You know, the past few months have been difficult ones. Seems like the only thing on the news anymore is reports of sickness and death. Every day we get an update on how many cases of COVID-19 been reported worldwide, how many people have died because of this horrible virus. And every day the numbers seem to go up higher and higher. But over the past few weeks, death has come a lot closer to home. Friends in nursing homes have died. Relatives have passed away and we can't even visit the families. Our district superintendent lost his father-in-law last week. One of our church members lost their son-in-law unexpectedly. And then my own mother-in-law passed away. Though my mother-in-law was 92 and lived a full life, the son-in-law was very young, 35. And we can't help but ask, Lord God, where are you in all this? You know, when someone we love is sick, we pray as hard as we can for their recovery. And then they die anyway. And we find ourselves grieving their loss, wondering what we'll do without them. We find ourselves wondering where Jesus is as we try to comfort a sorrowing family member or friend. We wonder what in the world we could possibly do or say to take away some of their pains, to make their sorrow somehow easier to bear. We've all been there, or we will be someday. And if you know what it means to listen for a footstep that never comes, to long for a voice that can no longer be heard, then you know how Mary and Martha felt that day, today's gospel story. These sisters were suffering because of the death of their brother Lazarus. The story began when Jesus received word that his friend Lazarus was ill. Jesus didn't drop everything and rush to his side. He waited. In fact, Jesus didn't even go until he heard that Lazarus had died. He says in John 11:11, 11, 11, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. Now that seems like a very odd thing to say until we realize that the Greek word for sleep here can mean either sleep or death. The disciples, thinking that he meant sleep, that Lazarus was merely asleep, said, oh, that'll be good for him. He needs the rest to help get it better sooner. Then Jesus said bluntly, 
Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. Those words sound so final. When we're on the receiving end of words like these, they smash our hopes, they tear at our peace, and they gouge great holes in our heart. In that moment, we begin to feel real grief. Someone we love is dead, and there's nothing more to say. Lazarus was dead, and there was nothing more to say, nothing more to do. Death seems to have had the last word. And then Jesus arrived. Martha, always the busy one, hurried out to meet him. She greeted him with what sounded like a rebuke. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. You know, when we come face to face with the finality of death, don't we ask the same type of questions? Mary and Martha questions. Lord, if you care so much, why weren't you here? Why didn't you answer my prayer, Lord? Just like those folks who were mourning Lazarus' death. When we come face to face with death, we ask that big question. Where were you, God, when I needed you? But then Martha softened her words by adding, yet even now I know that God will do anything you ask. What a fantastic faith she has. Jesus said to her, your brother will live again. She said, yes, I know. He'll be raised to life on the last day when all the dead are raised. Again, what a fantastic faith. But you know, that kind of faith wasn't very common in Jesus' day. For that matter, it's not common in our day either. You may remember that the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. This life was it, period. But the Pharisees did believe in life after death. They believed that at death, the two worlds of time and eternity met. They believed that at the end of human history, there would be a general resurrection of all the dead. And Martha shared that Pharisaic faith when she said to Jesus, yes, Lord, I know my brother will rise again on the last day. Well, Jesus didn't try to explain to her what he was talking about. Instead, he asked her a simple question of Martha and of you and me. Do you believe that? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that the glory of God will conquer death? That's not what we expected Jesus to say. Along with Martha, we want to know where God is. And Jesus counters with, do you believe? He asked this question to each one of us as we stand outside the tombs, which mark those moments of loss in our lives. Well, yes, of course, we believe Jesus. Why else would we be here? We know that even though things might look pretty bad right now, someday, some way, God will eventually prevail. Someday, but not today. See, Jesus, we're practical, down-to-earth people. We're realistic. We still live in a world where missionaries are slaughtered for trying to help orphan children or people don't have enough to eat or sufficient medical care where people are dying of COVID-19 and we don't know how to treat it. Let's get real here. We just don't believe that the body is going to jump out of the casket and dance at the funeral, Lord. It's not going to happen. And then into the emptiness of the barrenness of our present reality steps Jesus. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am that hope and that you've been waiting for. I'm the one sent from above. I'm the one God sent. I am the resurrection and the life. I come from the creator, from the life giver. And those who believe in me will not live only a physical life, but an eternal one. And not at the end of time. But with me here now, even as we speak, even as we speak. And then he asks again, do you believe this? This is God's offer of resurrection. This is the opportunity to pass from death to life. In Jesus Christ, God has sent the offer, not of old life restored, but of new life 
on new terms. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, ever the pragmatist said, Lord, he's been in the tomb four days. There's already a stench. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the presence of God in your midst? Did I not tell you that the life-giving God is here now before you in the person of the one who was sent, the Son? Jesus said, take away the stone. Seems so simple. Take away the stone. But it's not that simple for us to roll away the stone in front of the tombs of our lives. You know, death comes in many forms. We recognize it best when it takes physical shape, robbing us of our loved ones. The person we knew, the person with whom we shared meals, the person we laughed with and argued with and played with and worked with is gone from this world. We know this death. We recognize this death. We know how to mourn this death and how to celebrate the eternal life promised to us on the other side of the grave. There are other deaths, deaths that are not so recognizable, such as the death of dreams, hopes, and of plans. Been experienced a lot of that during these last days of pandemic. The death of careers of abilities, of options, the death of relationships, of, of identity, of esteem, of the death of our own inner self. These deaths, though full of torment and anguish, often go unmourned and uncelebrated because they don't come with any promise of life beyond the grave into which they're buried. We look around at our private cemeteries, counting the growing number of losses, losses of all, all kinds during these days of COVID-19. And like Martha, all we know is that someone, something dear to us is gone. All we know is that now we're empty, that there's a barrenness where there had been a promise of sweet tomorrows. We, like Martha, hope that Something someday will bring life again out of the barren emptiness that we feel. But even though we're realistic, heaven help us, we do still believe. Even when the situation seems hopeless, we go on believing. Even in the face of death, we go on believing. Because we know that one day God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. We know that one glorious day we will join hands with all those that have died before us and stand in the glory of God and sing hallelujah to the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, who gained victory over death. We know that one day we'll feed one another from the banquet table our Lord has prepared for us. And we know that we'll bind up each other's wounds with the healing balm of Gilead and that our tears will be wiped away by Jesus himself, who's been crying with us because he knows our pain. Yes, Lord, we do believe all this. That's what keeps us going. Despite the harsh realities of life and death in this imperfect world, we know in our souls that if it were not for our trust in God, our very lives would be like cemeteries. Apart from our trust in you, Lord, our world would become a cemetery full of people without hope. A cemetery filled with the tombs of dead lives, dead dreams, and dead hopes. All sealed with great stones with only the promise of decay and lifelessness behind those stones. Yes, Lord, we believe everything you've told us will come to pass someday. Someday. But not today, Lord. We're not looking for any miracles today. Just let us cry over our losses, okay, Lord? Is that too much to ask? And then Jesus said, 
take away the stone. And they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know you always hear me, but I said this so that this crowd standing here can believe that you sent me. I'm no magician. I don't have magical powers. I speak aloud to my father so that everything I do will be understood as coming from you, Lord. So these people will believe that you, their God, have sent me. And then suddenly Jesus cries out to the one, the things that we mourn. Lazarus, come out. And the one we mourn, those things we mourn, come forth. No, they're not as they were before, but they're restored on new terms. They're transformed. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Wait a minute. What else is going on here? There's something else here that we need to see. We've got to see that Jesus himself saw these things. He saw a tomb. He, he was not far from Jerusalem. And the tomb was a cave with a large stone covering the opening. And the stone was rolled away. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and there were grave cloths. This was not only Bethany, this was Calvary. The Son of God looked at the tomb of Lazarus and saw another tomb waiting. He called forth his friend from death because he knew that new life comes from death. And he said it himself. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. As surely as Lazarus had just left the tomb, Jesus, what was really happening here was that raising in raising Lazarus, Jesus had just performed the act that would bring about his own death in order for Lazarus's fate to be changed, Jesus's fate must be sealed. That having come from God, Jesus must return to God. And the way of return is death. Death. Before any friends or relatives can prepare to let him go, before any of them can grasp the situation, before any of them can realize that there's nothing they can do to stop it. So we stand with them, believing the unbelievable, that the one before us is the resurrection and the life. We stand here believing that because of Jesus, eternal life begins not at the door of the tomb, not even at the end of time. It begins now with him, with Christ. It begins with the Son of God. Because you see, God's not willing to let death have the last word. Despite our questions, despite our doubts, who knows, maybe even because of our questions and doubts, we go on believing. Yes, death still hurts. But as we struggle to roll away the tombstones to help one another remove the wrappings of death that bind us all in one way or another, we remember that we are the church and that we of all people know that when God commands, new life comes forth. And not just someday, not just in the sweet by and by, but today, right now, resurrection is a reality. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. We come here on the Sunday wanting to believe the unbelievable, longing to believe, needing to be able to believe that you, the Christ, have life, not just on this side of the grave, but on both sides. And Lord, we believe that this life is ours now, today. Thank you, Jesus, for being our hope in the face of death. Thank you for life, eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, we 
ask that as we continue our worship with our tithes and offerings, we ask that you would continue to support the church in your um, gifts, with your gifts. Um, you can give online on our website, www.collingtonumc.com. You can mail a check and get the address on the website as well. Or you can even donate um, with PayPal. And we thank you in advance for your gifts. Um, our prayer list this morning is long. Um, I do have an update from Patsy Rush. Let's see. She said that John Irvin is... Uh, has completed successful lung surgery, but he's too weak for chemo to start. So pray that he would be strengthened and healed. Pray for the family of uh, Steve and Linda in the loss of their son-in-law, for the Holloway family in the loss of their matriarch. Pray for um, Charlotte Beasley's son-in-law's mother, Dana Sito, who suffered a stroke. Um, pray for the DS and his wife, Linda, and the death of her father. Um, my cousin, Christy uh, Campbell, has been hospitalized with liver and kidney failure. She has lupus and has had for years and is dealing with that. Um, Ron is still suffering from back pain. Pray that he would be referred to um, a doctor who could finally help him. And we give thanks for J.W. Johnson's recovery from surgery. He's um, doing much better. Uh, Maureen Turner is scheduled to go into surgery. Peggy White's sister has suffered a so stroke. Her name is Linda. Um, and uh, Betty Clark, who has coronavirus, is in a nursing home. That's a friend of uh, Ronnie Sue and Kat. I know there are many other needs out there this morning, and uh, I'm just thankful to be able to say this morning how much I appreciate worshiping with you in this way, knowing that you are here with me. Seeing your names means so much, and uh, we ask you now to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. A kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, thank you for this time together. Go and worship each and every day in the name of the Lord that loves you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.